Today, the industrial pharmacist is a vital member of the health care team. He is the one who takes the chemicals that have been found to control disease and makes them available in the various dosage forms. As we shall see, there are many opportunities open to the pharmacist in industry. He develops new methods and machinery for doing a job better. It is he who guides the drug from the laboratory through production to the marketing of the finished product. The industrial pharmacist is the quality control person in the strongest sense of the word by making sure that the active ingredients are truly available to the patient. Unfortunately, time will not permit us to explore all of these opportunities in depth. However, we shall discuss some of them, introduce you to some of our pharmacists, and go into several of our laboratories and work centers. Discussion with students across the country have indicated to us that the potential for the BS pharmacists and industry has not been adequately explored. We here at Upjohn wish to present some examples of what we feel are exciting and challenging industrial opportunities. This presentation then is a unique and novel approach. The first time that practicing industrial pharmacists have discussed and visually portrayed these career options with you, the pharmacy students. Hello, I am Dr. Carl J. Linton, and this is one of my colleagues, Mr. Ed P. Strelinski. Ed, when you were undergraduate in pharmacy, how did the various career opportunities look to you? Well, Carl, all the opportunities in pharmacy seemed real excellent to me. I could probably say that the majority of my class went into community pharmacy, some went into hospital pharmacy, and still others became medical service representatives. But myself, I chose Upjohn in the pharmaceutical industry. And we're very happy that you did, Ed, but how and why did you make this choice? Well, I guess I felt that pharmacy in its purest sense is being practiced in the pharmaceutical industry. And when a pharmacist joins a full line house like Upjohn, he has the additional challenge and opportunity to work on a very broad range of dosage forms. And the opportunity to grow both personally and professionally as an individual. After graduation, you completed your internship, took and passed the state board, you joined us. Then what happened? Well, I was given a short orientation program throughout the company, after which I was assigned to work with a senior pharmacist. And together we undertook various projects which related to the research and development of solid dosage forms. How are you able to keep up with these great advances that are occurring today in scientific pharmacy? Well, Carl, first of all, I attend technical meetings and various short courses which are related to my work. Secondly, I have the opportunity to hear the very excellent seminar speakers which are brought into the company at frequent intervals, and they talk about their latest work. Okay. And third, I can take advantage of the Upjohn Employee Educational Assistance Plan, whereby the company will pay the major part of my tuition for courses which I take at our local universities. What is the mission of your group of pharmacy research? I guess the primary mission of pharmacy research is to design and develop quality dosage forms as efficiently as possible, and also to do some basic research in our field. Uh, we take, for instance, a PhD pharmacist in pharmacy research would probably concern himself with fundamental research on the design and performance of a particular drug delivery system. And the BS pharmacist? Well, the BS pharmacist would initially work with a PhD or another BS senior pharmacist until he gained enough experience in research and formulation studies on dosage forms. After he'd gotten, gotten this experience, he would become an independ independent investigator, uh, which would include preparation of clinical supplies and design of various other dosage forms. Uh, the BS uh, research pharmacist would also initiate studies on the drug molecule before he began preparing dosage forms or clinical supplies. I see. So that we can learn more about these pre-formulation studies uh, on the drug, we're going to visit several of the pharmacy research laboratories. May we meet you later uh, for an in-depth discussion of a typical research project? Sure, Carl. I'll be in the tablet lab a little later. Thank you. In this pharmacy research laboratory, Dr. Gordon Flynn is studying the stability of a drug over a wide range of conditions. He will run a chemical kinetic study and determine the pH profile as well as the pK of the drug. 
Dr. Shaw knows the crystalline form and degree of hydration of the drug may affect its biological availability. To differentiate among the various polymorphic forms, Dr. Shaw may use differential thermal analysis. To determine the degree of hydration, he may use thermal gravimetric analysis. As the drug may react with some excipients, the research pharmacist looks for these possible interactions before he begins his formulation studies. He uses various techniques, such as thin layer chromatography. Dr. Anthony Sincula knows that some drugs are unstable under certain conditions. He attempts to isolate and identify the products of decomposition. By knowing what can happen, he can often prevent it from happening by proper dosage form design. Dr. Walter Morosevich and Mr. John Oakes know that it is sometimes essential to alter the chemical structure of a drug to change its properties. A drug which is painful upon injection can be made painless by chemical modification. By decreasing its partition coefficient, the modified derivative will diffuse away from the injection site rapidly, resulting in minimum pain response. Now let's rejoin Ed Strelinsky in the tablet lab. A few years ago, our pharmacist at Upjohn began studying the tableting process with an eye as to how this procedure might be improved. These studies entail two major areas. First, we wanted to find a better method of producing tablets, and second, we wanted to find out if we might monitor the tablet compression step. Oh. What about the then uh, conventional method of making tablets? Well, we felt that the conventional methods of granulating and slugging were really not the best for all tableted products. That's when we started thinking about direct compaction, which but eliminated the slugging and granulating steps. But direct compaction wasn't new to up, John. No, that's right. It wasn't new. We made aspirin tablets by this method for uh, a number of years. What is the pharmacist's responsibility in making tablets by direct compaction? Well, the pharmacist has a good deal of responsibility in the direct compaction formula. First of all, he selects the ingredients of the proper size range, and if they're not available, he'll have to mill them to a pre-selected range. Mm -hmm. He selects the mixer and establishes the right mixing time. Then he'll have to keep very close tabs on his moisture content, moisture limits. And lastly, he'll select the tablet punch and die, as well as the tablet machine for preparing the, uh, the dosage form. And all of these factors are very important to the performance of the final finished product. Yes, they are. Can you give us another example of some basic research which this group did? Sure. Upjohn was the first pharmaceutical house to actually monitor a rotary tablet machine. And we did this so that we might take a look at compressional and ejectional forces of the, a of the actual tablet making process. Now, we did this by connecting strain gauges to the key components of a rotary tablet machine. These strain gauges send electrical impulses into a dual beam oscilloscope. These os oscilloscope tracings are shown as peaks or spikes. And in order to make these spikes meaningful and permanent, we can swing over a Polaroid camera and take a picture, which, which is a permanent record of the uh, tracing. Now, the pharmacist to monitor compression and ejection can use either the oscilloscope screen or he can make a permanent record with a with this camera and make a picture of it. That's right, and I have an example of a, an oscilloscope tracing right over here. This, this tracing illustrates a very poorly adjusted tablet machine. We look for two things in this tracing, the uh, peak heights and the uniformity of the peak heights. Here we see we lack, we lack uniformity. Taller peaks represent harder tablets, shorter peaks represent softer tablets. Too hard a tablet may inhibit availability, whereas too soft a tablet may break up in the bottle before it ever gets to the consumer. Here's another picture, Carl, of, of a very uniform tablet machine uh, setting. This, this indicates a very uniform product. Now, Ed, I see how you could make uh, some nice research data and you get a nice paper out of this, but how does it help the pharmacist on a practical basis to make tablets for Upjohn? Well, Carl, uh, small adjustments in a rotary machine like this will often go unnoticed unless the machine is monitored. And these, these adjustments can influence the availability of the final dosage form. Without monitoring, the effect of these changes, like I say, can go unnoticed. But uh, 
aren't oscilloscopes a little far removed from present day uh, pharmaceutical education and orientation? That's right. We don't learn about oscilloscopes and strain gauges in pharmacy school, but I had the opportunity to learn quite a bit about strain gauges and oscilloscopes from our Upjohn engineers who have had a great deal of uh, past experience with these things. Would you say that any pharmacist anywhere can learn how to use an instrumented rotary tablet machine? That's right, Carl. Any pharmacist anywhere. Any pharmacist anywhere. That's Thank correct. Thank you, Ed. This is Craig Payot, another one of my colleagues, whom I've asked to summarize our work on the in vitro availability of solid dosage farms. Craig? Availability testing here led to our development of the automated dissolution rate apparatus. With it, we can measure the time it takes for the active ingredient in a drug product to go into solution, as opposed to disintegration time, which is the time it takes for the drug product to break up. When did we first get into this type of study? We first got into this uh, work when it was realized that it was a useful and valuable tool. With it, we can predict what may occur in the gastrointestinal tract when a drug product is introduced. We can also use it to screen and select tablet formulations. And we've also learned over the years that correlation of disintegration time and dissolution rate can be most helpful to us, but it can also be contradictory. Oh, that's very true. We have a chart here which illustrates this point. This chart compares the disintegration and dissolution rate data of two brands of prednisolone tablets, brand A and brand B. As you can see, the disintegration time for both brands was almost identical, approximately six minutes. However, the average time it took for 50% of the drug to dissolve, in the case of brand A, was approximately four minutes, and the brand B, approximately 80 minutes. Subsequent human clinical evaluation showed a distinct difference between brand A and brand B. It did. How do you run a dissolution rate test? Can you uh, explain and show us your apparatus? Right. Upjohn was the first laboratory to automate this process. This is a typical example. We drop the tablet in this conventional USP disintegration basket. While the basket is being moved up and down, solution is being withdrawn through this tube by means of this peristaltic pump pumped into this UV spectrophotometer through a flow cell and back into the beaker. The absorbance is then read and recorded by this recorder. Is that a typical dissolution rate curve you have there? This is a rather typical curve which shows on this axis the amount of drug in solution versus time on this axis. Now, Craig, this is nice, but an in vitro study must be confirmed with an in vivo human study. To explain this aspect to us, I've asked another one of our colleagues, Dr. Mildred Chorotska, to come in. Millie? On this chart, we have a summary of in vivo and in vitro data for three formulations in a 12-patient crossover study. The three formulations were essentially identical, except they varied in the concentration of one minor component in order to give different dissolution rates. The dissolution rates here are represented as T20. That is the time required for 20% of the drug to dissolve in vitro. The in vivo data is represented as the clinical response versus time. And we can see as the dissolution time decreased, the clinical response increased, indicating faster and better absorption for the fast dissol dissolving formulation. That's true, but Unfortunately, we can't always assume that the faster dissolution rate tablet will give us as good as or better absorption than the slower rate tablet. Yes, this point can be illustrated on the next chart. Here we have a summary of a eight patient crossover study. Again, the two formulations were essentially identical. And from the dissolution times, we would expect that formulation B would be better or at least as good as formulation A but the area under the clinical response curve was only 62% of that for formulation A. Plus, clinical response is always not, lead, not directly related to the dissolution rate. An important point to remember is that dissolution rate is a valuable tool, but it doesn't solve all our problems nor eliminate the need for in vivo testing. That's true. How is uh, dissolution rate data best used? In my opinion, dissolution rate is best used in determining the reproducibility of a manufacturing process. Good. That is, if you have lots of a drug with considerably different dissolution rates, something's probably wrong. That's true, too. Uh, one last uh, important, interesting, but sometimes controversial question, really. 
Can the dosage form affect a bioavailability? Yes, very much so. We definitely know that if a drug does not dissolve in a reasonable time interval in the GI tract, it probably won't be available for absorption. Thank you, Dr. Taraska. With me is Carl Sackman, and we are standing just outside the sterile products manufacturing area. Carl, do you remember when we first met? Of course. I was a senior student in pharmacy, and you visited the university on a recruiting trip. Do you remember any of the questions you asked me that day? Yes. I probably asked a lot of questions. One of them was, is there a place in industry for the BS pharmacist? Turn the table. How would you answer that today? I believe that there are many challenging and interesting opportunities for the pharmacist, depending upon his likes and interests. You know, there are a large group of pharmacists in our manufacturing divisions. Yes, there are. And one of the questions you asked me that morning that I remember is, will I become a five-year technician? How would you answer that one today? Yes, there's no doubt in my mind that the current undergraduate pharmacist can also become a scientist in the pharmaceutical industry. I agree. You're a member of what we call Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Development. What's the mission of this group? We improve the pharmaceutical manufacturing processes. We scale up the production and manufacturing of new drugs, and we improve the existing formulas. We also serve as technical advisors to all of the manufacturing units. The work on dosage form is initiated by pharmacy research. Yes. Then the pharmacists in our group continue the scale-up and yes. transfer into full-scale production. Are there pharmacists in manufacturing other than in your area? There are pharmacists scattered throughout the various manufacturing units. Some cross-check the quantities and lot numbers of the raw materials against the production work orders. Yes, sir and others supervise the manufacturing processes, such as the freeze-drying of mixovials that is going on behind us here. I see. Mixovials, what is that? Could you tell us something about it? Well, this is an Upjohn exclusive that now represents about 87% of our present freeze-drying capacity. The mixovial permits the marketing of an otherwise unstable solution, and this is accomplished by filling the active ingredients into the lower compartment of the mixovial, freezing and drying them. Then the center stopper is positioned, and the upper compartment is then filled with the diluent. Then the top stopper is placed in position. If pressure is applied to the top stopper, the diluent then dislodges the center stopper, thereby reconstituting the product. Here we have an example of a reconstituted product. Are there any other pharmacists in manufacturing other than in the areas which we've discussed just now? There are some pharmacists in our product coordination services. This group coordinates and prepares all of research and development tickets as well as the production work orders. They also have to keep themselves abreast of the changing food and drug regulations. They prepare the label copy and package inserts, and they also help in the coordination and collection of some of the parts of the IND and NDAs. After the product has been manufactured, samples are taken and sent to control for assay and then eventual release. So to learn more about control, who also has pharmacists in their division, Let's go upstairs to one of their laboratories. With me in control is Dr. Robert Buller. Bob, what does control do? What is their function? The main function of control, Carl, is the analysis of raw materials as we obtain them from their various sources, and of course, the pharmaceutical products which we make from these raw materials in their various stages of development and manufacture. Now, what type of research would a group such as this do? Well, our group here is uh, engaged principally in development of new methodology for the analysis of these materials. And of course, for this purpose, we have many analytical instruments, such as this gas chromatograph here, which we utilize for this purpose. 
But we don't want to leave the impression that uh, all of this in industry is done with modern instruments and black boxes, do we? No, Carl, of course we do not. We both know that the scientists can never be replaced by instrumentation. However, uh, instruments do enhance the work effort and do make our uh, studies much more precise than they otherwise could be. Now, control is another area where a pharmacist may either be chemically oriented or biologically oriented. Uh, we've discussed the chemical aspects of pharmacy, but uh, what does a biologically oriented pharmacist such as yourself do in industry? Well, the industrial pharmacist uh, may extend uh, his efforts in pursuit of basic or applied uh, research, and in the control area, we're engaged in both basic and applied research. That's true. And uh, of course, uh, for this, by virtue of his background and training, he's uh, very adept at bioavailability and bioassay studies in which he uses animals, such as this dog here, and this gas chromatograph, and many other similar instruments. The PhD, of course, uh, supervises and plans such studies. And the BS would do the bioassays in the earlier work we discussed. That's true. Uh, now, it was an Upjohn pharmacist not too many years ago that helped carve out the fields we now call biopharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics. That's true, Carl. Bioavailability studies are first run early on the life of a product. When does control run these studies? Well, control is interested in bioavailability studies, Carl, throughout the life of the pharmaceutical product. Uh, to assure, of course, uh, that it is physiologically available uh, throughout its life up to uh, its uh, labeled expiration date. Thanks, Dr. Buller. You're welcome, Carl. In our discussion with pharmacy students across the country, the subject of the Upjohn personnel policies and practices has arisen with great regularity. So we have asked a fifth-year pharmacy student, Joseph Conrad, we discussed this subject with Mr. Doss Jackson of our personnel division. Joe? Well, although salary isn't all that important to me at the present time, I realize that it does have a place. So what is the salary picture for pharmacists at the various levels? All right, uh, first let me explain. I've, I really feel that we are very competitive in terms of starting salaries and other salaries for pharmacists. Uh, and let me explain, too, now how salaries are given in terms of increases. First of all, there are three ways you can do this. Uh, one is the merit increase. The merit increase is given for really good performance. That's what a merit increase is given for. And there's no set pattern as to you can get one every six months or one every year. It depends on your performance. Secondly, you can get an increase uh, through promotion. In other words, if you're promoted from one job to the next, you are entitled to an increase at that time. And third, you may get an increase through the, what well, is known as a general cost of living. Top management decides sometimes, usually during the year, sometimes twice a year, that the cost of living uh, factor has grown up high enough to give employees across the board, and that's for everybody, uh, an increase depending on what the cost of living is. For instance, the, recent, the last one we had was 3.5%. Let's see, well, how is your benefit program set up? Okay. <clears throat> we have a very, I think, comprehensive benefit plan, and it includes, includes such things as life insurance, uh, retirement, uh, savings plan. For instance, the savings plan, to give an example on how it runs, the savings plan is designed primarily to encourage you to save. And the incentive is, up John adds, for every dollar you put into the plan, 50 cents. So uh, then that's, that's one of the other benefits. Now, for instance, we have a the medical plan. The medical plan is very cost to you is very minimal since you're, you're single it costs you 45 cents a month for the plan and it's a very comprehensive plan designed especially for upjohn uh, just give you an example of how much upjohn spends a year for benefits last year on the average upjohn spent about forty six hundred dollars per employee which is about 41 percent of our payroll dollar i see well this question is probably the most important to me what are my chances for advancement and increased responsibility? Okay. Well, just first of all, let me preface by saying that some of the uh, people in Upjohn have moved, moved very far in the company. For instance, our vice president of manufacturing is uh, a pharmacist by training. Uh, several of his 
managers who are managers of managers are pharmacists, uh, a director of control, for instance, is a pharmacist. So pharmacists have moved quite a bit in Upjohn. Uh, now, how we do this at Upjohn, presently we have what is known as the Job Opportunity Program, which gives really individuals in the company a chance to say, I would like to be considered for certain jobs. And we do this by posting all jobs on the bulletin board. And if you see a job that you feel that you're qualified for and you would like uh, to be considered, uh, you simply send in a, a job opportunity application form. And we take, your, take you in consideration from that. So these are the methods we use for getting you promoted within the company. I see. Well, how many pharmacists does the Upjohn Company employ in, say, technical positions and also supervisory positions? Okay. At Upjohn, we have approximately 550 pharmacists working for us. Of that 550, 70 of them are in supervision in the home office, and approximately 63 are in technical. Now, we have in the field, in the sales, uh, which includes a salesman and supervision, about 350 somewhere. I see. Well, how soon after starting could I expect to begin moving up? Well, that depends really on you. Uh, it depends on the individual. If the individual has quite a bit on the ball, you can rest assured that he will be moving up in the company. Uh, and again, we use the Job Opportunity Program. You can use that as a means. Uh, but again, it depends on the, what jobs are available and uh, what your interests are. I see. Well, now that we've answered uh, my personal questions, I have some questions that are of a more general nature that are on the minds of students today. Uh, what is the Upjohn Equal Opportunities Program? Well, uh, at Upjohn, we really feel that we should make a strong effort to promote people based on their qualifications and hire people based on their qualifications. Uh, we, though we have a very active program at Upjohn, for recruiting minority candidates and uh, females, for instance. Because we really feel that that's an untapped labor source and we should really should try to take advantage of it. I see. Well, could you forecast the future needs for pharmacists at the Upjohn Company? Sure. Uh, well, I have to answer this based on past experience. We at Upjohn have always needed pharmacists and we've always hired pharmacists during the year. And I really believe, based on the nature of our business and our growth, we're going to constantly need pharmacists. So I feel that's going to be a great need for us. Okay, well, it's been very nice talking to you, Mr. Jackson, and thank you for your information. Okay, Joe. Thank you, gentlemen. Today we have seen that there are many opportunities for the pharmacist in industry. There is an important place for both the BS and the PhD pharmacists. We here feel that these are interesting, exciting, and challenging opportunities. For those of you who have not made a final career decision as yet, may we suggest that you seriously consider the pharmaceutical industry. If there's anything that you, more that you would like to know, or if there's anything that we can help you with, please feel free to either write or contact us at the Upjohn Company, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Thank you. <laughs>